Good morning, everyone. We're going to give it a few minutes here and let people join, and we'll be right back with you. Good morning or afternoon for those of you on the East Coast, and thank you for attending our Ask the Experts webinar. The topic of this webinar is embedded leases. I'm Steve Hills, and I lead Riveron's Denver office. Joining me in Denver today is Helen Mason. Helen is a managing director in our financial advisory practice and is a firm leader in lease accounting. Helen has a background in both big four in industry and has led ASC 842 implementations for clients across the country. For those of you who have not joined us previously, this is our fourth installment in the Ask the Experts webinar series. In previous webinars, we've covered practical expedience, accounting impacts of ASC 842 adoption, 
and collection and abstraction of leased data. We do have one more scheduled webinar in our Ask the Expert series. It will be on June 20th at noon Eastern, and it will cover process and control implications of ASC 842 adoption. We'd like to make this webinar as interactive and targeted as possible. To that end, please don't be shy about asking questions via the Q&A feature. We will pause periodically to address as many questions as we can. Also, we will be asking several polling questions throughout the webinar. Not only will your answers help us to direct our commentary, you are required to answer all polling questions in order to qualify for CPE credit. Within a week of this webinar, you will receive an email from Riveron with your CPE certificate and a survey on this webinar. With that, I'll hand it over to Helen. All right, thanks Steve. Good morning everyone and thanks for joining us. Um, as Steve mentioned, I've been involved in assessing and implementing ASC 842 for our clients over the past almost two years now. In my experience to date, uh, the embedded lease topic has been one of the major challenges slash hurdles that companies face both while adopting 842 as well as when determining how to stay compliant with ASC 842 going forward and verifying that they are continually identifying embedded leases. All right, first, um, we wanted to quickly review the definition of a lease under 842, which dovetails into the nuances and considerations within the identification of embedded leases. So on this slide, you'll see under the new guidance, um, one, a lease exists if one, there is an explicitly or implicitly defined asset in an agreement, uh, what the guidance defines as an identified asset. And secondly, um, the customer controls the right to use the identified asset. Uh, the concept of embedded leases existed within 842, but what we found is that most companies didn't perform a robust analysis to identify those types of leases and agreements in the past. Um, <clears throat> some industries have been better about it than others, but nonetheless, all companies must provide documentation around their procedures performed to identify embedded leases at adoption dates. From both an external audit and internal company standpoint, it wasn't a focus previously, but the introduction of the updated and broadened definition of a lease within 842 has shown a spotlight on the need to perform a more complete analysis of existing agreements and vendor relationships. The major concepts to consider when identifying whether embedded lease exists or not um, are, you know, does the agreement contain or make reference to a specific asset or group of assets? Um, like I mentioned, you know, in the definition, that can be an explicit or implicit um, identification of the asset. The use of this specific asset is required to fulfill the obligation set forth in the agreement. And third, the customer of the agreement has control over the specific asset <clears throat> throughout the entire non-cancelable term of the agreement. Um, again, you know, another thing to note, an agreement does not need to contain the word lease or rent or, or any of those kind of obvious things to be considered um, a lease. Um, the last point on this slide is a big one because the word lease, rent, you know, all of those things do not have to exist for an agreement con to contain a lease. Therefore, a comprehensive understanding of the implications of the new definition of a lease is paramount in determining what agreements must be reviewed to verify the existence of any embedded leases. Um, before, before moving on, let's take a look at the first polling question. So the first polling question, did your company appropriately identify embedded leases under ASC 840, AKA the old lease guidance? A, yes, B, no, C, I prefer not to say, or D, I'm not sure. And we're gonna give it a, about a minute or so to let people answer. I have a feeling I know where this is going to trend, but uh, we will we'll let you guys know here in a few how this is ending up. 
All right, so we're going to share the results here with everyone. Um, probably not a huge surprise. The, the most common answer is D, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Share results. And we also have a lot of B, no. All right, so that, that was, you know, kind of what our expectations were. Honestly, I thought there'd be some more. I'd prefer not to say. <laughs> Thanks for those that, that were honest there. Um, all right, so, you know, with that in mind, let's discuss some of the major areas and agreements that could contain leases. Um, so we'll go to, yep. okay. So here's just a visual of some of the things that we've seen and a lot of, you know, auditors and others have brought up as potential agreements for, um, that would contain vetted leases. So. IT services, um, dedicated manufacturing capacity as a service contract. So those are really agreements that in the past you would have viewed as strictly a service, um, but now kind of looking through those to see if there are any assets identified um, that are required to perform that service. Sales contracts as well as supply contracts. Um, we're going to get into some examples of those, <clears throat> but let's hit the next polling question quickly um, just to gauge um, where everybody's at on some of these. Sure. We're going to launch the next polling question. All right, so polling question number two. Where do you anticipate that you will identify or have already identified embedded leases under ASC 842, IT service agreements, manufacturing agreements, transportation agreements, or other? And while we're waiting for the, all the, the poll results to come in, just a reminder, please ask questions. Um, we definitely would like to direct this and make it as relevant as possible for everyone. We're going to start getting into some more nuance and detail, um, so expect that, that questions will come in. All right, so results are in um, IT service agreements, almost 50%, um, and then other is 30% is with a bid on manufacturing and transportation. All right, and we will get to an IT example later, um, but glad to hear that some people are finding that IT agreements do indeed contain um, embedded leases a lot of times. Um, all right, so Moving on to the next slide, we're going to get into a little bit more detail behind the challenges of identifying embedded leases. You know, we've reviewed um, what is the definition of a lease, obviously, um, and some culprits of where to find embedded leases. Um, but now let's discuss additional specifics surrounding the challenges of identifying them. So. Um, you know, historically, did you consider whether an identified asset existed within a service contract or software license agreements? Um, most likely not, especially when it comes to the service side of things. Um, again, like we spoke about earlier, many times, you know, contracts do not use terms like lease or rent to allow for easier identification. Um, have you considered a complete population of potential leases? Um, the main concept on this slide we'd like to focus on is completeness. So 
In the 842 assessments and implementations we've been involved with to date, completeness is definitely the first thing that we tackle. So from the standpoint of adopting a new accounting standard, whether it be you know, 842 or other, um, there's a high hurdle in both determining and documenting that you've considered the complete population of leases and have first appropriately identified whether or not agreements contain a lease under the new definition under 840, 842. Um, and secondly, what the appropriate accounting treatment is for those leases. So, you know, when we talk about completeness, it's one, did you look at every agreement and vendor relationship you need to to identify them and say yes or no, is there or is there not a lease? And then secondarily, um, did you reach the right accounting conclusion, for example, short term, um, long term, and then the classifications of operating, financing, sales type, et cetera. So on this topic, um, we've adopted a three-prong approach to verifying completeness. First, we advise conducting inquiries with all major department heads that are involved in contracts, vendor relationship management, and operations. So examples of the list of folks to include in those initial inquiries are legal counsel, both internal and external if applicable, um, supply chain, IT, and then the operations folks that lead all major facilities, locations, or types of operations depending on um, what industry you're in. And then these discussions will help identify major areas of concern for embedded leases. Um, a lot of things come out of those conversations that even sometimes, you know, the accounting folks that were supporting uh, did not know about. So um, having those conversations right away will help really um, hone in on where you need to look first and where some of the large risks are. They'll also educate the other departments and functions outside of accounting on what to look for. Um, you know, a lot of this, you need input from folks outside of accounting. And so to the best of your ability, educating them on what the new definition of a lease really is, um, and then applying some practical examples you know, in those conversations for them to consider within their, um, portions of the organization. Um, and then, you know, the, it will serve as audit evidence supporting your completeness procedures. I think it's a nice thing to kind of layer on top of some of the other completeness um, exercises that we'll get to, but really, um, you know, letting people know, and the auditors especially, that, um, you know, here are the folks we've talked to, um, here's what they said, and then also kind of documenting your follow-up on those things. Um, so second, and oftentimes in tandem with the inquiries, a detailed um, vendor spend analysis is performed for a trailing 12-month period. Um, this is unfortunately exactly what it sounds like. Um, the analysis is taking a detailed look at your spend on a monthly basis by vendor um, over a 12 month period. Um, this serves as the detailed portion of the completeness procedures and is obviously the most time consuming. Um, one thing to note here, sometimes that data um, is hard to get at depending on your ERP system. Um, one kind of thing to consider before you start down that process if you have not already. You really want to look at it from the AP side of things, right? So all of your cash out the door over a 12-month period. And then to the extent possible, what a, a real time saver when completing this is if you are able to get that data out of your system where it tags the other side of that entry. So what I mean is, obviously we're gonna pull that detail from the actual AP account to see all cash out the door. 
but um, if you have the ability in your system to show what the other side of that entry is, it can help you um, navigate what accounts to really look into most and what things that you can maybe, um, you know, take off the table from the very beginning, like, you know, your hedge settlements account or things like that, right? Things where um, banking, you know, things that you know, most likely there's not a lease. Um, a couple other things to consider um, the vendor spend analysis are materiality and the method um, of excluding vendors that you do not believe contain leases. So again, documentation is key for both of those items. Um, how did you determine the materiality level for your vendor spend analysis? And then where you've, where you've determined not to look at certain vendors in detail, how did you get comfortable with that? Um, I, I will say for a lot of our public clients, those two questions have come up a lot um, when we speak with the auditors when we were getting through Q1 2019 procedures. So you're obviously going to have a lot of vendors and determining your materiality level up front and documenting why you're comfortable with that. Um, sometimes what we've seen is that you can al align it with your um, capitalization policy. Although I will say historically what we've seen is those are quite low. Um, for some reason, $10,000 seems to be the CapEx policy number at most companies regardless of size, right? So um, even if that is your capitalization policy, you know, you can look at other things like coverage percentages and things like that to try to make it a palatable amount of vendors to take a look at. Um, so the vendor spend you know, review file will be the backstop for identifying all embedded leases. Um, it's the first thing, like I said, that the audit team will ask for um, and theoretically where they will spend the majority of their time from an audit standpoint. Um, and then lastly, in our three-prong approach for completeness, <clears throat> when available, um, obtain a complete listing of contracts from your legal department. Um, I say when available because a lot of times that doesn't exist, but um, this will help verify that you've identified all agreements that may contain a lease through um, your inquiries and vendor spend analysis processes. So, um, like I said, most companies don't have an up-to-date contract listing available, but anything that you can get your hands on is helpful just to cross-reference it to um, the inquiries and vendor procedures performed. You can, um, you know, take a look to make sure that you've looked at everything big. It also sometimes will give you an insight into if there are agreements that have been executed, yet there's been no actual um, cash out the door related to those contracts, it will give you a little bit of a leg up on things to maybe start looking into that the agreement's been executed, um, but you haven't spent any cash on it yet, so it didn't come up through your vendor spend analysis. Um, and maybe in your inquiries, you know, nobody happened to bring that one up. So just another kind of nice to have to the extent it exists. A lot of times it doesn't, so you know, no worries if not, but a good kind of cross-reference there. Helen, if I can interrupt for one sec, we did have one question come in. Sure. Um, based on your experience in implementing ASC 842 and completing these vendor spend analyses, what type of effort have you typically seen um, from, a, from a company perspective, from a consultant perspective, and sort of executing on that? Sure. So, like I said, this is by far the largest time suck when it comes to the completeness exercise. Um, some companies honestly have a hard time even getting at their vendor spend data in a way that can be manipulated and analyzed easily. Um, like I mentioned, if you can tag the other side of that journal entry to your initial population, that can save a ton of time on the front end because you can see certain um, accounts where all, you know all the vendor spend associated with that account can be um, you know taken out of the analysis to start with. 
in large companies, you know, we're looking at anywhere from 100 to 500 vendors, I mean, or more, right? So the things to keep in mind here are, it's not really sufficient to just pull one invoice per vendor, right? Because the fear there is that they do more than one thing for you or your relationship with them and the services that they provide changes month over month. So when we start to tackle the vendor spend analysis, you know, we really like to sit with supply chain and the accounting folks to understand some of the really large vendors, right? Sometimes you can take the top 10 to 20 vendors and get a very large percentage coverage on your spend. And so with those, it's really understanding the relationship there. And then, you know, on a case by case basis, you're going to have to decide just how many invoices to pull. So the other thing to consider from a time perspective, you know, are your invoices scanned in somewhere in alphabetical order by month that a consultant or an internal employee or someone can get at very easily? Um, are they in paper copies at one central location or does each operating facility have paper copies for themselves, right? So thinking about some of that stuff, um, just getting at the data, like I said, how many vendors do we have to look at? And then just how many invoices per vendor and do we even have good access to the invoices? So across the board, this has been the heaviest lift and takes you know numerous weeks, if not a couple months or more to cover off on, just depending on how uh, many vendors and how hard it is to get at the invoice copies. So a big lift and we've seen most clients engage you know, us um, or someone else to kind of come in and help them get through that because as we know, people have day jobs and the adoption of 842 is not usually listed on said day job. So um, getting through that data, it, it can really take a while and you have to make sure every kind of decision you're making along the way to either look at a vendor or not or how many invoices you want to look at, you've got to document all those decisions because an auditor or someone's going to pick that up, you know, eight, nine months down the road and look at your fancy Excel file. But if they can't understand, you know, why you concluded that's not a lease, if they don't have a lot of context and documentation in there, you're going to be reperforming that to prove that back out to them. So, um, you know, a lot of effort on the completeness front. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, no, that's that great. one. We did have one other question too on an example of a, a manufacturing agreement that could constitute an embedded lease. I think we're going to get into we some will. examples later, so maybe we'll we'll sort of punt on that for the time being, but we will come back to it. We will. Yep, there's a few examples on the manufacturing states that we're going to cover later. Um, all right, so the last point on this slide highlights the other major challenge, um, which is, you know, inherently embedded leases are not straightforward. They're embedded leases. Um, and so therefore careful analysis must be done as to whether the agreement truly meets the definition of a lease. Um, oftentimes there can be an explicitly identified asset, but the concept of control is more difficult to nail down. Um, for example, things like protective rights do not represent control. This is where subjectivity really comes into play. So gaining a detailed understanding of the agreement itself and then how it works in real life is very important. Um, oftentimes, this is where the comprehensive conversations with both the operations folks and legal team really help paint the picture of exactly what's happening um, with that vendor, with that agreement, those that are closer to it, and they can provide some guidance on the determination of control as it's defined in, in ASC 842. And one other comment there, um, you know, when you're engaging with the legal folks, they've got a very different um, definition of control from a legal perspective in their mind versus, um, you know, what ASC 842 and the FASB are getting out with control. And so, you know, it's, it's helpful to hear them out and kind of how, what the legal view of some of these agreements are, but 
that's where, like I mentioned before, just the education of the other folks um, in your organization, you know, is helpful so that they can really help you define um, if there is control of the asset <clears throat> in that agreement or not. Um, all right, completeness. So, um, Steve, why don't we move on to the next polling question? Sure. All right, so polling question three, which of the following areas do you expect to be the biggest challenge facing your organization in relation to embedded leases? A, ensuring we are analyzing a complete population of leases. B, deciphering the technical guidance on what constitutes an embedded lease. C, identification of embedded leases on a go-forward basis after adoption. Or D, I do not expect identification of embedded leases to be a major challenge for my organization. And we'll give everyone a minute to get their answers in. All right, so the results of the polling are in. Uh, clear leader with A, uh, ensuring a complete population of embedded leases, which Helen just spent a fair bit of time talking about, uh, and not a whole lot of D, I do not expect identification of embedded leases to be a major challenge. Yeah, sadly, D D's not the winner here. Um, yeah, like I said, the embedded lease identification is, is a tough one. Um, but it looks like everybody's kind of on the right path here, right? The complete population is kind of a bit of a black hole. So um, good times. All right. Um, we will move on now um, a little bit more detail. You know, once you've got some agreements uh, that you think you need to consider here, we're going to go through some of the questions to ask yourself while you're doing that review. Um, after we go through these questions, then I've got some detailed examples that we'll roll through and we will touch back to that manufacturing um, question. And again, feel free to shoot us. We've had a few other questions come in, so just shoot some questions um, over as we start getting through some of the more um, detailed stuff here. So, all right, questions to consider. Is there an identified asset, you know, through our previous webinars and things to date, we've, we've kind of pounded that in already. Um, is the asset on premise at the customer's location? So this nuance can help you determine control in some circumstances where it's questionable. Um, does the customer have the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits from the use of the identified assets throughout the period of use? There's a lot going on there, um, but <clears throat> the, the substantially all of the economic benefits, that is gonna be a key point um, when looking at some of these embedded leases. Uh, does the customer or the supplier have the right to direct how and for what purpose the identified asset is used throughout the period. Um, does the customer have the right to operate the asset through the period of use without the supplier having the right to change those operating instructions? Um, that one is usually a pretty clear um, answer on control there if the supplier really does not have um, any say in how you're gonna use that asset. Did the customer design the asset or specific aspects of the asset in a way that predetermines how and for what purpose the asset will be used? Um, the, that question kind of relates to build um, assets that are kind of built for you for very specific things. Um, those, those are tough ones to kind of get out of the lease determination usually. 
Um, all right. Does the customer have the ability or right to control physical access while obtaining or controlling more than a minor amount of the assets output? Um, that may sound like a foreign language to you. We're actually going to do, um, we're going to review an example of that one specifically. Sometimes the physical um, access component or answer is what ends up determining if the customer does indeed have control. Um, lastly, is there only a remote possibility that one or more parties other than the customer would take more than a minor amount of the output of the asset, the identified asset, and the price that the customer would pay was neither contractually fixed nor equal to the current market price per unit. Um, if you fall into the bucket of number eight, you should definitely phone a friend. Um, there's a lot of nuances that go into um, some of these manufacturing and supply agreements where we talk about output of the asset and then um, the pricing per unit associated. So um, I'm gonna review now, uh, we don't have slides for these, but just a few um, specific examples. And so please feel free um, to you know, put any questions in that you have along the way. I'm gonna go through a couple of these in detail um, and then we can go from there. And actually, before we jump into the examples, we did have another question come in relevant to um, sort of the, the questions to consider here. So in your experience, has the guidance changed significantly from ASC 840 to ASC 842? Or is it really more about sort of the lack of, of focus historically around embedded leases? You know, great question. I, I, I answer this one a lot. So um, I think first and foremost, what we have found, why this guidance, you know, is new and exists is that really historically and in some industries were bigger offenders than others. The embedded lease analysis was really not being done, right? Folks had disclosed these things um, in their filings and commitments and contingencies table and you know not done a real complete analysis now the definition of a lease has slightly changed you know this concept of control has has changed enough where you do really need to review um, probably some of the conclusions you've reached in the past but um, i i think in real life right this just was not a focus previously and now once you get into the land of adopting a new accounting standard and proving out completeness, um, you've really got to make sure that you reviewed everything. And it really touches back to uh, one of the first webinars we did actually around some of the practical expedience available. Um, there is one that Addy spoke about back then about, you know, kind of taking everything from 840 and bringing it into 842 with not a ton of analysis, um, that package of three. Now, we have seen in practice um, that be really tough for folks to take advantage of because you really had to have documentation under 840 that showed how you got completeness then. And so from an audit perspective, we've gotten a lot of pushback if clients try to adopt that. Um, because they're just really not comfortable that <clears throat> things were done, you know, completely in the past, I guess. Um, all right, so uh, we let's look at a warehouse agreement example here first. Um, and I'm going to get through as many of these as time allows. We'll have one last polling question to make sure everybody gets their CPE, but please um, feel free to ask other questions as we go through this because we'll use the balance of the time to go over some of these examples. Um, all right, facts and circumstances here um, are that an entity has an arrangement with a supplier for the right to store products in rooms one, two, and three within a storage warehouse. The rooms are highly specialized and customized to store medical products. So these could be things like temperature controlled, um, you know, certain types of access to that space that they're renting. <clears throat> um, rooms one, two, and three represent only 60% of warehouse A's total capacity. The supplier has no substantive right to substitute alternative space 
in place of rooms one, two, and three. Um, and the supplier can use the remaining 40% of the warehouse as they see fit. So in this example, um, the asset is explicitly, you know, specified in the contract um, rooms one, two, and three. Um, next kind of question on the identified asset front is, is the asset um, physically distinct or does the customer have rights to substantially all of the assets capacity? Um, yes, in this one, the arrangement provides that the entity specifically use rooms one, two, and three, um, you know, in this specific warehouse. And then last question there on identified asset is does the supplier have a substantive substitution, substantive substitution right? Wow. Um, in this example, the supplier has no substantive right to substitute alternative space in place of rooms one, two, or three, um, given the supplier cannot relocate the entity's product at its sole discretion. Now, let's pause there for a second because if we slightly change the facts here to say that um, the warehouse agreement did not um, say that there were certain rooms within the warehouse or if the customer did not have specific things like um, needing temperature control or special access to the rooms or anything like that, if the warehouse was able to kind of move that customer's pallets or items around the warehouse to kind of continually um, make available additional space for other customers, the answer to that one would be different, and then you would not necessarily have an identified asset. Um, so, you know, in this example, yes, there was an identified asset, um, and then from the control standpoint, um, does the customer obtain substantially all economic benefits from use of the asset? Yes. Um, no one else is allowed to store products in rooms one, two, and three within the warehouse. Um, and then can the customer direct the use of the asset? Yes. You know, they told the warehouse the specifics of what they needed um, within that arrangement. So in this one, yes, the entity has control. Um, and the contract is a lease. One thing to note though, um, sometimes understanding whether the customer obtains substantially all economic benefits it is tough to get at. Um, in certain arrangements, you can't really tell from the supplier side, you know, if you are actually obtaining all economic benefits. Um, so that is one where there could definitely be some subjectivity and really just understanding to the extent that they'll, you know, talk you through it, whether um, you really are getting all of the economic benefits. Um, all right. Uh, next example is a transportation agreement. So the facts and circumstances here are an entity enters into a transportation agreement where Entity and carrier will agree on which vehicles to use to transport entities staff. The carrier agrees to keep these specific vehicles solely and exclusively for the entity's use. Um, should any of those specific vehicles not be available due to breakdown or maintenance, that type of thing, um, the carrier will provide suitable substitute vehicles. <clears throat> And then carrier has other vehicles readily available. However, it's not likely that the carrier will generate additional benefits um, by substituting the vehicle. So in this one, um, it, the assets are explicitly identified, the you know, specific vehicles used for transportation. Um, the asset is physically distinct um, and then does the supplier have substantive substitution rights? Um, in this circumstance, the carrier's substitution right is not substantive because the economic benefits from substituting the original vehicles for an alternate vehicle would not exceed the cost of substitution. Um, so for this one, yes, identified asset. Um, 
And then control, does the customer obtain substantially all economic benefits? Yes, they're the only ones, you know, allowed to use these um, vehicles during this time period. And then can customer direct the use? Yes. So in this instance, um, there is an identified asset, there is control, so that contract um, is a lease. Let's do one IT one real quick here um, before we go to the last polling question and any questions that have come in. Um, all right, so this one is a data center arrangement. Um, a lot of folks have these. Um, at times, they're very kind of different arrangements, but um, facts and circumstances here are an entity enters into a two-year agreement, agreement with Data Center Corp, the supplier, um, under which the entity will place its servers and related equipment in a locked wire cage um, in 10,000 square feet of supplier's 120,000 square feet multi-use data center. So in this um, circumstance, the entity owns the fixed assets, right, the actual servers, but they are leasing the space in which they're placing those. Um, the space in the data center can be divided into separate units by placing these removable cages. That's very kind of normal circumstances. Um, the supplier has the right to move entity servers and related equipment <clears throat> to a cage in another location in the data center, um, provided there's no disruption of the entity's operations. Um, the one thing to note here is that the supplier's cost to move the customer servers and related equipment to another cage is minimal. Now, like I said before, you may not know the answer to that question, um, but to the extent you can get a feel for kind of what that supplier cost is for any kind of substitution would be key. So <clears throat> the entity will control access to its cage and their employees will operate the service, um, servers and related equipment. And the entity does not have information about the space available in the data center um, that, that they're not leasing or any terms of the contracts with any other customers. So um, an asset is explicitly identified that 10,000 square feet um, within the data center. Um, the asset is physically distinct. Um, and then does the supplier have substantive substitution rights? Um, because the entity cannot readily determine whether the supplier has the substitution right, the standard requires the entity to presume that the supplier's substitution right is not substantive. So in that circumstance, um, look, more likely than not, you really do not have a good look into what your supplier's costs are. So um, when you don't have you know, a look at their substitution rights, you, you're gonna assume per ASC 842 that they are not substantive. All right, control. Um, the entity does have the right to obtain all the economic benefits from the use of that space. It is 10,000 square feet for them only. Um, and then directing the use of the asset, the entity can direct and change how and for what purpose the space is used. They could store whatever they want there. It just so happens that they're storing servers, um, et cetera. So in this one, um, it is a lease both because there's an identified asset um, as well as the control component. All right. Um, let's maybe move on to our last polling question here, um, and then we can discuss that and then any other questions that may have come in. Um, and if we've got time, we've got one more IT equipment example um, that we can go over as well. Great. All right. So the last polling question, how did you or how do you plan on appropriately identifying all embedded leases at adoption date? A establish an internal task force to review existing vendor arrangements in search of embedded leases, B, engage the third-party consultant to assist in the identification process, C, we already have controls in place to identify embedded leases, or D, have not started or are in preliminary stages of adopting ASC 842. 
share the poll results here. So in the lead, we've got B, engage the third-party consultant. Obviously, we like to hear that. <laughs> um, and then A, A and D are also um, pretty common responses with 25 and 29%. Yeah, I think, you know, the key, one of the key takeaways here, if you've, you know, got nothing from the last 50 minutes, is just that the completeness exercise, which obviously supports your search for embedded leases, you know, as you start to think about how you're going to tackle adopting ASC 842, that needs to be a major consideration, um, especially, you know, to the extent you're a private company that has not you know, fully vetted how they plan to do this. Um, you know, getting budget, um, I know it's already somehow we're into June of 2019, but, you know, just really speaking with some of your executive team, letting them know that you may need outside help um, and kind of letting them warm up to that idea right before you um, talk about engaging a third party. But like we said, it is a heavy lift. And so kind of war warning others in your organization early that um, either, you know, there's going to be some time of yours taken away from your normal day job um, or, you know, really getting the approval to kind of bring some other folks in to um, help you out with that. So, um, with that, we just want to make sure that there's no other questions. Um, you know, one thing we will say, obviously, is that um, feel free to reach out after the fact. We've obviously gone over a lot here today, so definitely um, feel free to email myself or Steve or any other folks at Riveron that you may be in contact with. Happy to help. Um, really just answer any questions, help you game plan, kind of depending on where you are in your process. We've been doing this for quite a while now. So, um, you know, definitely have some tips and tricks at this point to help you get started um, if need be. Um, Great. Well, if there's no other questions, and I, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in right now, um, that will conclude our prepared materials. Um, thanks so much for joining us today for the, the fourth installment of our Ask the Experts webinar series. As I mentioned, the final installment of this series will be on Thursday, June 20th, and will cover processes and controls that need to be put in place to sustain compliance and get your auditors comfortable that you've successfully adopted ASC 842. Please feel free to reach out with any additional questions, as Helen said, our email addresses are up on the screen right now, so feel free to write those down. Um, we're happy to chat further on any of the topics discussed today or any not discussed today, right. within reason. <laughs> uh, have a great rest of the day and week, and we'll hopefully talk to you all on the 20th.